The short answer to these loaded questions uh, is found in our purpose statement, which you can find on the back of this morning's bulletin. So if you would, please grab a bulletin, if you have one, and turn to the back. Because I'd like us to read this purpose statement together in unison. So I'll give you a second to find a bulletin. And you'll see right on the back, it says, at the United Baptist Church of Ellsworth, we begin with our purpose. So does everybody have their bulletin and ready to go? Okay. The United Baptist Church of Ellsworth, our purpose is, let's read together, to exalt Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and to aid in the advancement of his kingdom by the leading and power of the Holy Spirit. All right. Our purpose, I'm going to take these sort of one at a time, is first to exalt to exalt means to praise or to worship somebody or something, to raise somebody or something in rank, in position, or esteem. Glorify the Lord with me, the psalmist says. Let us exalt his name together. Let us exalt, it means let us make high the name of the Lord in the Christian church, and certainly in this fellowship. The one that we worship and the one that we lift up is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the only Son of God the Father, who came to this earth to live the sinless life that we cannot live, and paid the price for our sin, that we might no longer be subject to sin or indebted to it. We lift up Jesus. We are all about Jesus. It is our purpose as a church to exalt him, to elevate him above all else that is in our lives. Our purpose is to see that in the final analysis, and through whatever form we express our faith together as a fellowship, Jesus is the story. Jesus is the star. Jesus is preeminent. Jesus is the headline. It is our purpose to exalt him, to elevate him above all else that is in our lives. We lift him up as Lord, the New Testament word is kurios. It means one who is supreme, the controller. He to whom a person or thing belongs, about which he has the power of deciding. Jesus is Lord, which means he's the ultimate authority in our life together as a church. He's the master and he's the ruler. One way we understand this relationship of Jesus to the church is through the example of the human body. By God's design, the church is a body. It consists of many parts. They work together to form a whole. The healthy, mature church functions as a body where Jesus is the head. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 18, the Apostle Paul writes, He, speaking of Jesus, is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. By God's grace, we are part of this body, the church. Yet all of us, hands and all of us, feet and all of us, eyes and ears, are in submission to Jesus' lordship and leading as the head. His is the vote that matters most. He has the supremacy. Jesus is Lord. That makes us servants. We have been bought with the price of his blood. And so we know that he has a right to direct our affairs, individually and corporately, because as the scripture teaches us, we are no longer our own, but we have been bought with a price. So our job as Christians and as church members is to be sensitive to Jesus' prompting, to listen to what he says, and to obey. We may ask ourselves, it's very natural to do that, what do I think about this or that when it comes to church life? 
But the more important question is, what does Jesus think about it? What is Jesus telling us? Our corporate decisions, at least the corporate decisions of a healthy and effective church body, are made in response to his lead. He is Lord. He is supreme. And he is Savior. Part of our purpose, a blessed purpose, is to proclaim the simple truth, to hold fast to the trustworthy message that we find in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. Beloved, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. We do not revere Jesus here as a mere moral man or acknowledge him as a good teacher among many as this world has seen. We understand him to be Savior. In the words of John the Baptist, he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus is living proof of God's love. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Someone might say, Pastor, why do you use that verse so much? Don't you know any others? And the answer is this, because Madeline Merchant told me to. <laughs> Honest to goodness, many years ago in a visit now, she quoted that verse and she said, people need to hear that. People need to hear that. And I agree completely. Jesus is the rescuer of our souls. Jesus is the giver of eternal life. And we exist as a fellowship to make this known. To proclaim him as Lord and Savior and to aid, to aid, to help, to assist. We are, as we choose to be and to the extent that we choose to be, the available help for God's will to be done on earth. Our purpose is to aid, not to be solely responsible, which I want to address in a few minutes, but to collaborate, to be co-laborers with God. We aid in the advancement. It was on page 181 of the old red, red hymnal, and I knew it by heart. I knew it when I was preparing this message that it was on page 181 of the old red hymnal. But I went to check, and for sure it was. One of my favorite hymns as a kid growing up in this church, a tune with a bit of energy, probably that's why I liked it so much. And verse 3, which began with these words, like a mighty army moves the church of God. Onward, Christian soldiers. We aid in the advancement. What is advancement? To advance is to move somebody or something forward in position. When I think of advancement in the context of the church, I think of Christian soldiers. I have military images of an advancing army that takes back territory that the enemy has taken, that goes and takes over territory and expands its influence. To advance implies movement. Pressing forward. And this is why sitting still for any length of time is not an option for a Christ-following church. Certainly we want seasons of refreshing and times of rest, which we use to reinvigorate us for the work. But sitting still for any length of time is not an option for a Christ-following church. <laughs> Staying the same, standing pat, refusing to change, that is contrary to our purpose. Most churches that don't intentionally move forward end up sliding backward. Churches that don't consistently look outward end up looking inward, and they become cloistered and self-serving. Making people happy takes the place of making disciples. And this leads to that infamous criticism attributed to Paul Harvey. Too many Christians are no longer fishers of men, but the keepers of the aquarium. Oswald J. Smith a Canadian pastor, author, and missions advocate born in 1889 wrote some time ago, it matters not how spiritual a church may profess to be. If souls are not saved, something is radically wrong. And the professed spirituality is simply a false experience, a delusion of the devil. People who are satisfied to meet together simply to have a good time among themselves are far away from God. Real spirituality always has an outcome. I see no reason why we can't meet together, have a good time, and see souls saved. 
as we work arm in arm and shoulder to shoulder to advance God's work in this world. Our purpose involves the advancement of his kingdom. The word kingdom in scripture means royal power, kingship, domain, rule. When Jesus told his disciples to pray, he taught them to say, thy kingdom come. We pray the same prayer, thy kingdom come. And what we're all praying when we do that is for the success of the gospel. We're praying for the success of the gospel, for the spread of the acceptance of God's rule and reign of God's influence. Jesus spoke a lot about the kingdom. In Matthew's gospel, chapter 13, verse 31 and 32, he said, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field, though it is the smallest of all your seeds. Yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. Tom Rayner and Eric Geiger do a great job of unpacking the meaning of this parable in the new chapter of their book, Simple Church. In particular, they show how the last part of this parable, the birds of the air come and perch in the branches, is not just flowery imagery, but meaningful teaching with roots in the Old Testament. What this phrase means, and quoting now from the book, the vision Jesus articulated to his disciples is that the kingdom of God will be such an influential and powerful movement in the culture that those outside the kingdom of God will benefit from the influence of the kingdom of God. People will benefit from the kingdom's existence and they will come and rest and receive shelter in its branches. The kingdom of God will be such an influential force that the community, the city, and the culture will benefit from the presence of the kingdom of God in our churches. God's desire for his church is that our faith will transform not only us, but also those around us. His desire is that the cities, the communities, and the neighborhoods where our churches are planted will benefit from our faith regardless if they believe what we believe, profess the faith we profess, or live by the values of the kingdom. That's the kingdom that we are helping to advance by the leading and power of the Holy Spirit by the leading and power of the Holy Spirit. That sounds really spiritual, doesn't it? That sounds really good. And I got to this part of the message and thought, boy, that's good. If it's true. No. You know, we always have to stack it up against our realities. And the more I thought about this, and how do I, how do I artic articulate this part of our purpose, I, was, I hearken back to a story in my own life, uh, and I apologize if it's a repeat for those of you who have heard it once or twice, but it does fit, I think. I was, many years ago, made responsible for uh, a program uh, uh, that served a lot of kids, and so in this newfound responsibility, I totally rewrote the whole standard operating procedures uh, which needed to be done because the old ones were awful. And so... I came up with this lovely uh, treatise, uh, a very thick uh, and very detailed standard operating procedure manual. And then I invited the psychiatrist of our facility at the time. It was a facility to, uh, to help with emotionally disturbed kiddos. And I invited him to our staff meeting so that we could talk about this new standard operating procedures, this new way of running the program. And he said he'd be delighted to come and talk with us, which was awesome. And so he came to our meeting, and we all gathered around me, my brand new staff, the psychiatrist who'd never really been invited to anything before and was just happy to probably be a part. And yet, right in front of everybody, he grabbed this great big thick document, and he looked at me and said, okay, Dr. Thomas, what do you think about this? And he looked at it, and he said, Scott, this won't work, and he threw it on the coffee table. And I had two choices. I had to think quick on my feet. One was, uh, you know, first would be a little defensive. Do you realize what I just poured into this? I'm, I haven't seen my family for a week for crying out loud. I've got this beautiful document. You're telling me it won't work. But I figured, you know what? He's the authority in this matter. And so I just said, Doc, why don't you tell us why it won't work? And that's where our conversations began. And eventually we made something together that did work. Years later, coming back to the same facility, and talking with this friend of mine, who had become a good friend. Um, we were talking about that day. Doc, do you remember when you set me up in front of the whole staff and you hung me out to dry like that? And he looked and he said, Scott, you didn't want my input. 
You wanted my blessing. And he was right. And I thought, you know, sometimes we Christians are more interested in God's blessing than his input. Like we make the plan and then we say, uh, Lord, would you bless that, please? I think that's a good idea. And if it's not, could you make it a good idea? We ask him to bless our plans, and it's okay to ask God to bless our plans, but it might not be necessary if we were to take the time to discern his plans for us. We don't have to come up with plans if we discern his plans. And if we can discern his plans for us and walk in them, they are blessed already. The scripture tells us that God has prepared beforehand good works that we should walk in them. We don't have to come up with the good works, beloved. We have to figure out where they are and get there. And then we know they are blessed. So yes, honestly, by the leading and power of the Holy Spirit, having the Spirit of God out in front of us instead of behind us and seeking his input instead of just his blessing, we want the blessing too, but we want the input first. It is a leading in the power of the Holy Spirit that sets the church apart from every other institution in the world. Without the leading and the power of the Holy Spirit, the church is just another organization. It's just another social services agency. It's just another institution managed by the wills and the whims of man. But with the Holy Spirit and because of it, our work as the church is sacred. And it is eternally significant. Because it is God's work. And it's much more than the best ideas of man or the product of human strength and ingenuity. The church that is led by and functions in the power of the Holy Spirit, listen, it's the church that makes the world different. What a humbling reality. What an awesome privilege to be included as part of the redemptive work of God in this world. Don't you agree? what the church is. This final sentence in our purpose statement, it reiterates, it underlines, it emphasizes the supernatural component of our life together and the plans we make. It is holy work. We do not do it alone. And that's a good thing because our thoughts and our strength and our resources are limited, but God's are limitless. Did you hear that? God's are limitless. Hard to remember this sometimes, isn't it? Because we're used to dealing with so much that is finite. So Paul's prayer for the Ephesians is a wonderful prayer for all of us who serve the Lord. In Ephesians 1, verse 18, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Glorious riches. Incomparably great power. The sky is the limit when God is in control and when his people believe. We'll conclude this portion of our service this morning by standing and singing together hymn number 401, following which we would have our communion service. If you are not comfortable or don't wish to stay,